Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the William G. McGowan Theater at the National Archives. Um, whether you're here with us in the theater or joining us through our YouTube station. Before we hear from um, Liza Mundy, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. On Monday, October 23rd at noon, law professor George William Van Cleve will discuss and sign his new book, We Have Not a Government, The Articles of Confederation and the Road to the Constitution. And a few days later, on Thursday, October 26th at 7 p.m., we will host the second annual McGowan Forum on Ethics on the topic of the challenge of big data. A panel of writers, corporate leaders, and government officials will examine the ethical responsibility of those who compile and track citizens' personal data and address the question, what responsibility do corporations and governments have to protect their customers and be transparent in regard to possible data hacks. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our calendar of, um, of events online at archives.gov. Check out our website or sign up to get your, th those updates by email. And you'll find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activity. To introduce our guest author, I'm going to ask Mark Bradley, who is our director of the Information Security Oversight Office here at the National Archives. ISU is responsible to the president for policy and oversight of the government-wide security classification system and controlled unclassified information program. Before his appointment last December, he was director of, of Freedom of Information Act declassification and pre-publication review, National Security Division, Office of Law and Policy at the Department of Justice. Mark served as Senator Daniel, Moyne, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's legislative assistant for foreign affairs and intelligence matters and was last legislative director, his last le legislative director. Mark's 2014 book, A Very Principled Boy, won the George Pendleton Prize for being the best book written by a federal historian as awarded by the Society for History in the Federal Government. But his most important credential is that Mark is Mr. Liza Mundy. So Mark. <laughs> Uh, David's absolutely right about that, and uh, thank you so much for your kind, uh, your kind words. Uh, I've never introduced my wife before, and you'll notice I have notes because I don't want to get this one wrong. Uh, uh, Liza is uh, a native Virginian. She uh, is from, uh, was born in Newport News and grew up in Roanoke. Uh, she is a graduate of Princeton University and then has a master's degree in English literature from the University of uh, Virginia. Her uh, journalism career started, I guess, originally with the city paper here in Washington. And from there, she moved on to the uh, Washington Post, where she became a uh, writer for their Sunday magazine and then later for their uh, style section. Code Girls is her fourth book. Let me get uh, some of the accolades right about some of the other books. Um, her 2012 book, The Richer Sex, which is about how women are replacing uh, men such as me in the workforce, uh, won a number of awards. Uh, it was named the top nonfiction book uh, 2012, one of the top nonfiction books of 2012 by the Washington Post, and a noteworthy book by the New York Times. Her 2008 book, Michelle, a biography of First Lady Michelle Obama, was a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 16 uh, languages. Her 2007 book, Everything Conceivable, received a 2008 Science and Society Award from the National Association of Science Writers as a book on a science topic written for a general audience, the best book written for a, a general audience. Uh, she writes wildly for publications now, including The Atlantic, Politico, New York Times, and Slate. She's appeared on MSNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, Fox News, uh, Diane Rehm, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and also the Stephen Colbert Show.
I think that out of all the books she's written, I think that uh, this is my favorite one you're going to hear about uh, today. I th think that it is because uh, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, in the first place to find a new topic about World War II that hasn't been written about. I think uh, next to the American Civil War, World War II is probably our most written about subject. So to find something such as this is a real, uh, not only a feat of research, but a, a feat of vision. The um, most important thing about this book, I think, is to go back in time and realize how desperate things were, were for us in World War II. Um, although it's difficult to, to uh, think about this now, considering how much uh, we've read about the greatest generation, we could have easily have lost that war. Up until 1942, we were on the ropes. And it was really the Battle of Midway that began to turn things around in the Pacific. And of course, also in 42, the Russians began to break out of Stalingrad. But it was by no means guaranteed we were going to win that war. And what you're going to hear about today is how we actually won that war. And the, just the extraordinarily important and pivotal role that American women code breakers played in allowing us to defeat fascism. And it's an extraordinary story. Thirdly, one of the things that occurs to me you know, in, the, in the work that I do, which is, is, is a lot of it, in fact, almost all my career has been spent in intelligence, is how unusual it is to find a group uh, of, 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 of uh, government workers who have top secret clearances, who didn't rush out to do kiss and tell books as soon as they were discharged. Uh, these women, uh, for the first time in 70 years, are now coming forward to tell their stories. And one of the things Liza will tell you about is just how not difficult it was for them, but just what an, what an antithetical experience it was for them to be able to tell their stories. They took their oaths of secrecy very, very seriously. And it, it's astonishing now when, when, again, you have books written by directors of CIA the minute they leave the post. Uh, yet here's, here are some stories that for the first time in 70 years uh, I've been told. And lastly, you know, I think this book is a strong rebuke to, to people such as uh, former Harvard professor Larry Summers, who questioned whether or not women innately could do mathematics or, or science. I mean, what an absurd notion. And thank God they can, uh, because without it, we might very well have lost uh, World War II. So anyway, without further ado, uh, I present to you my wife and uh, probably the most talented writer I know, uh, Liza Mundy. Thank you so much. I, I think that's the nicest introduction I've ever had. And um, I would have been happy just to sit there and listen to Mark talk about World War II. In fact, um, uh, you see now the resource that I had to draw on in my own household whenever I had a question about the war or intelligence. Um, and it was an extraordinary uh, useful. In fact, what Mark didn't say is that he is really the reason that this book was able to be written. I am fortunate that my husband's a person who reads declassified documents for fun and pleasure on weekends. <laughs> and he knew that I was looking for a, a great narrative, and those are hard to find. Uh, and one day he came and he said, well, this might be interesting. And he had been reading a declassified document by an NSA historian uh, originally written for the NSA staff, the National Security Agency, that talked about the history of Venona, which was the small, very top secret uh, code breaking project to, to break Soviet messages during the war and then after the war. We weren't supposed to be doing that. The Soviet Union was our ally. We weren't supposed to be reading the mail, but we were, because people do. And, uh, and, and that NSA historian, Lou Benson, had actually noticed that the majority of people working on that project were women, that many of them were school teachers recruited during World War II, who, who literally in a matter of weeks went from teaching very large classrooms of students to sitting at tables being presented with piles of messages and told, OK, figure these out. And, and Lou alone, I think, among historians of the time, thought that this was interesting and important and interviewed some of those women, some of whom were still at NSA. So that's a precious resource uh, that got me started on the project. So if, if he had not been paying such close attention to that document, if Lou had not thought to interview those women, and if Mark hadn't brought it to my attention, none of this would have happened. Uh, and and when, having read that document, I found my way out to uh, the NSA's museum, the Cryptologic Museum, which is our little version of Bletchley Park. Uh, and and, and so, 
historians and curators there laid out this much larger story of, of women code breakers during the war being recruited to work the Japanese army codes, the Japanese naval codes, the German naval codes, this massive story of 10,000 women being recruited under really quite interesting and entertaining circumstances to, to come to Washington and to break these codes. I couldn't believe that the story hadn't already been told. I think, as is the case with the Hidden Figures women, uh, NASA knew about those African-American female mathematicians. So it was known in the agency, but it took an author uh, committed to the story to get that narrative out. And similarly, I think people at NSA, or some people at NSA, knew that there had been this massive group of women during the war, although I'm not sure anybody quite realized how many there were. Uh, and, and, and I think what was not clear to any of us at that point was whether it would be possible at this late date to tell the story. And so in my talk today, I wanted to, because we're at the National Archives, because this is for me such a thrilling venue to speak at, uh, because of the documents that are housed in this collection, because my husband works here, but also because of the crucial role that the National Archives collections at College Park played in enabling me to credibly tell this story. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about the interplay between personal interviews and documentary evidence uh, that resulted in being able to tell this story in what I hope is a credible way. Uh, the book tells the story of 10,000 women, many of them college graduates, at a time when only 4% of American women graduated from a four-year college because many colleges were closed to women and also there were very few jobs that were available to female college graduates no matter how smart and talented. They basically could count on being a school teacher. That was the, really the one job that was consistently available and really only if you were single. Once you got married, you were expected pretty much to, to go home and to stay home. So the fact that, that these women came from uh, seven sisters, colleges, you know, academically elite Seven Sisters colleges and also teachers colleges throughout the South and Midwest. Ultimately, when the military admitted women, they were able to enlist. They came from California. They were scooping up librarians from California. So it was a massive effort in which women got on trains, sometimes troop trains, and found their way into two top secret code breaking compounds here in DC. One, Arlington Hall, which is in Arlington, Virginia, not far from where we live. And then one, which is on Nebraska Avenue in DC, where Department of Homeland Security is now. They had both been girls schools before the war. They were both commandeered by the military and turned into massive code breaking compounds where thousands of women worked to break these codes. So when I was getting started out to do this research, as I said, it was not at all evident that it would be possible to tell this story. I had my first conversation with the NSA historians in 2014, so we knew that if these women had been born in 1920, as many of them were, they would be 94 by then. Uh, and so simply, f they also would gen generally, when they joined up, they joined up under their maiden names and, and got married either during the war or afterwards, sometimes married more than once. So just tracking the women down, was going to be a challenge. Uh, and also, we had no idea what kind of documentary evidence there would be of their contributions. Of course, it was top secret. Uh, and as Mark said, one of the reasons that it was never told was because the women were told that it was absolutely essential not to tell anybody what they were doing at these code-breaking compounds. They were told to tell people that they were secretaries, that they emptied waste baskets, filled ink wells, and sharpened pencils. And because they were women, people believed it. So they, people, people just assumed that any work that women were, was, were doing uh, was uninteresting and unimportant. So it was very easy for them to keep the secret. They continued keeping it for decades after the war. And as Mark said, they realized at a certain point that not everybody was playing by the same rules. That in the 80s and 90s, some of the male code breakers began writing their own memoirs. Historians began writing about the Battle of Midway and other great code breaking victories, uh, the you know breaking of the Enigma code uh, that brought down the U-boats. Um, and, and the women continued playing by the rules that had been laid out in the 1940s. So we didn't know how much documentary evidence there would be of their contributions. Um, and in a perfect world, I would have started out my research by reading as many books as I could on on World War II and on code breaking during World War II. Then I think I would have read some uh, 
accounts of code breaking and tried to understand cryptanalysis and how it works. And then I might have gone to the National Archives to see what sort of collections uh, did exist in the stacks. But because of the actual actuarial deadline that I was working under, because I knew that these women were a frail and precious resource and I had to find them as soon as possible, it was like really like all reporting and research efforts, a desperate attempt to do everything simultaneously. So I had to find the women. I had to interview them as, as soon as I could before I had done the kind of research that would help me understand whether I could, uh, whether I could substantiate their accounts. So, uh, and, and finding the women was also a, a process in, in sort of desperation uh, and, and flinging out nets everywhere I could. Uh, so the NSA put me in touch with the family. They, they wanted to help with this project um, in part because they were, in large part because they were very, very committed to and proud of the story. Also, I think because if you're the NSA, what would you prefer, like one more story about Edward Snowden or would you prefer, you know, a book about heroic female code breakers? You know, I think that's pretty easy to answer, but I'm very, very grateful to the historians uh, and, and other officials at the NSA who, um, Betsy Smoot, who's an NSA historian, laboriously went through all of her files of families that had ever contacted the NSA about their mother or their grandmother's work, families who knew that their mother or grandmother had done something interesting during the war and didn't know what. She put me in touch with the family of a woman named uh, Carolyn Ruth Weston, who came from Bourbon, Mississippi. She was a school teacher, unhappily teaching school in a very rural part of Mississippi. She always said that um, school teaching was a respectable way to starve to death. She was making less than $900 a year teaching school in Mississippi. She was recruited secretly, got on that train, took a two-day train ride to Washington, D.C., and, uh, and not only played a key role in breaking the Japanese army codes during the war, but went on to work for NSA as a mathematician until she started having Having children and was expected to go home. Uh, she's no longer alive, but the family put me in touch with a wonderful woman named Dot Bruce. Uh, at the time, her name was Dot Braden. She too was a dis dissatisfied school teacher during the war. She grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. She was the oldest daughter of a, in a family of four children. Uh, she was being supported by her mother, who was a single mother. Her parents were separated, which was a source of great chagrin and shame to her in 1939 and 1940. So her mom was basically supporting four kids. The only job that her mom was able to get was as a secretary in a uniform factory in Lynchburg. Uh, and her mother was so determined for Dot to have a bit of an easier life that she foreordained that Dot would go to Randolph-Macon Women's College, which was a fine women's college in Lynchburg. It's now co-educational. Uh, and Dot did. By hook or by crook, she got a scholarship. She got family members to lend her money. She found her way into Randolph-Macon uh, and majored in English, but also did French and Latin and physics and all the courses that you take in getting a fine liberal arts education. Uh, the only job she could get when she graduated was teaching school, so she found herself teaching school in Chatham, Virginia, at a time when all the male teachers had joined up to fight. Her two brothers had also joined up to fight. Uh, and and to, just to show you the patriotism of people at the time, the Braden family so wanted to do everything they could to serve the war effort that they also volunteered their dog, Poochie, to join the fighting. Uh, they, wrote, they wrote the military volunteering Poochie services, and Dot still has a letter uh, from the War Dog Training Center in, uh, in Northern Virginia, thanking them for their uh, for volunteering Poochie, but saying that they had an age limit for war dogs and that Poochie was unfortunately too old. So he stayed at home. Uh, Dot, uh, as she put it, had all the teaching that year dumped on her because the male teachers had left, the women teachers had often left to marry the men. She found herself teaching almost every course. I mean, English, French, Latin, physics, hygiene, uh, marching the girls back and forth to lunch because there was a phys ed, phys ed, phys ed program to keep you know, citizens in shape for the war effort. And she was so exhausted when she came home after her school year that she told her mother uh, that she was never going back to that school again. So unbeknownst to Dot, the US Army, in a um, heated effort to compete with the US Navy for college-educated women who could serve as code breakers, had sent handsome young Army officers around the southern states, uh, because then and now there were 
fantastic bureaucratic regulations that they had to pass. And uh, because they were hiring civilians at the time, they had to recruit from the 4th Civil Service District, which was Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and West Virginia. So they sent handsome young men. And I literally found an oral history in which one of the um, top male code breakers was laughing about this ruse, this strategy. And he said, yeah, we sent these handsome young officers to recruit these barefoot girls from West Virginia because we knew that they would come to Washington hoping that they would meet a husband. So the thinking was that Southern women were, partic were particularly susceptible to the charms of a good-looking man. And in fact, when Dot walked through the front door of the Virginia Hotel in Lynchburg uh, to the Army recruiter, uh, her, one of her uh, motivating uh, factors was that she was trying to get out of an engagement. And that was true, actually, of many women. There was a lot of pressure to get married when the war started so that men could have you know, somebody to write to. And, uh, and, and, and her boyfriend was pressing her to marry him, and she, uh, she didn't want to. So that was, she was very excited about the idea of going to Washington. She didn't know what the job was that she was applying for. Uh, and I thought that I would um, let you hear Dot actually uh, describe her uh, after she applied for her job and, uh, and was accepted. She didn't know that extensive background checks had been done on her. Uh, describe taking the, uh, uh, taking the train her first time ever to Washington, D.C. with my two suitcases, my umbrella, and my raincoat, I went down to the train. Now my uncle had to take me down by, no car. And my mother and her sister were standing there crying when I got on the train. I was very secure that everything was going to be just fine. Washington would receive me with open arms. And the, the irony and humor there is that, uh, in fact, when she got to Washington, and she has very vivid, vivid memories of coming into Union Station, along with thousands of other women who were coming to Washington to serve the war effort, taking, the, taking a taxi into Arlington. She was headed for Arlington Hall. She didn't know where she was going. And she pulled up in front of this compound uh, that had, was circled with uh, barbed wire. She was ushered in, you know, this ex-school teacher with her suitcases and her umbrella. And uh, immediately, she was sworn in. She took an loyalty oath, that, uh, that signed loyalty oath I, I saw in her records. Uh, and she was um, then asked, well, do you need a bus to take you where you're staying? And she said, where I'm staying? Uh, she thought that the US military would put her up for you know, her, her wartime service, but no. She had to pay her own, not only did she have to pay her own way to Washington, um, but she had to pay for her own lodging in D.C. So she was taken by bus to this place called Arlington Farms that had been hastily, um, hastily constructed in Arlington as a, as a dormitory for 7,000 women at the behest of Eleanor Roosevelt. So that was a great surprise to her uh, that she was going to have to pay her way, and she actually had to call her mom and ask for money to be wired. So I, I had about 20 interviews with Dot Braden, uh, who was a wonderful raconteur, uh, describing her uh, the fact that within Within a matter of weeks, she was trained to uh, to decipher what were Japanese army messages. Um, the Japanese, as you know, were occupying islands throughout the Pacific, occupying peninsulas. They had captured Guam. They had captured the Philippines really subsequent immediately to Pearl Harbor. So they were arrayed throughout the Pacific, but they had to be supplied by, uh, by ships. They had to be uh, supplied regularly by ships carrying food, fuel, oil, troops, spare airplane parts. And Dot didn't know it, but she was sinking those ships. She was trained to decipher those messages and, um, and, and provide the intelligence that would be then relayed to American submarine commanders uh, who would be waiting when the ships appeared on the horizon. She was part of, and she didn't know this really completely, she was part of one of the most important code-breaking efforts of the war, and, and a largely unsung effort because it took place over the, over the course of you know, more than a year to sink almost all of those Japanese supply ships so that troops were left without arms, without you know, spare airplane parts, without food. Uh, without medical supplies and 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 you know 
the islands, as MacArthur said, were allowed to wither on the vine, in part because she was sinking those ships. And she was doing it within a matter of weeks. So as we were doing our interviews, she was trying to remember how the decoding worked. She had never told her family about this. And they had, they had come to know maybe two decades ago that their mother had done something during the war effort. They knew that their father was a meteorologist during the war, that he was working in Africa and the Middle East, uh, predicting the weather that would keep the pilots safe. So they knew their dad had served the war effort. They knew that their parents had written all during the war to each other. They still had the letters that they had written. They didn't know that their mother, Dot, had been actually writing five or six men during the war. Um, <laughs> I didn't get that on video, and she was, a little, she was a little reluctant to divulge that for a while, and she was a little worried that it would show up in the book. But um, she actually inadvertently gave me one of the letters that one of the other men had written to her, and. Uh, and so I was able to brandish it, brandish it at her and say, um, you know, uh, this is a wonderful letter. I have to use it. Uh, but in fact, uh, I was also able to assure her that some women were writing as many as 12 men at the same time uh, because, uh, because they were encouraged to do so, because they were supposed to keep up morale, among other things. So she and her husband became uh, engaged, actually, over the mail. Uh, they knew each other a little bit, but they didn't know each other well. And this was true of many of the women that I interviewed. Uh, so the family had known this, but they hadn't known what their mother did. And in our first interview, her son Jim was sitting there, and we were trying to convince her that, uh, that it was OK to talk, that the NSA had finally said that it was OK to talk. And I think she toyed with us for a little while. I think you know she really did want to tell the story. She had been very good about keeping the secret. But she did draw it out for a little while during the course of the interview, to the point where her son Jim was threatening to leave if she wouldn't talk. And um, at a certain point, she said, well, you know, what will they do? Will they put me in prison? And, uh, and I said, well, if they do it, it will probably be a nice prison uh, in, at your age. And, uh, and she thought that was funny. And, and she started to tell this incredible tale of taking the train and also um, one of the things that she could remember was that, that it was her job. She would decipher these numerical messages as far as she could. She would see words. Uh, she would see number groups that stood for troops embarking or troops debarking. She would jump up for the table, and she would take it to a woman named Miriam, who was the overlapper. And it was her job to overlap messages that Dot and other school teachers were bringing. Uh, and, and Miriam, the other thing that Dot really remembered was that Miriam was the most condescending northerner that she had ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and Miriam was from New York City, uh, where Dot had never been, and would say things like, I've never yet met a southerner who could, um, who could speak proper English. And that offended Dot, as it was meant to do. And, uh, and me meanwhile, um, she was eyeing the diamond on Miriam's finger. Mi Miriam claimed to have a... Uh, a fiance somewhere in the fighting, and she had this yellow diamond on her finger. And Dot had her suspicions that both the diamond and the fiance were fakes. So <laughs> the two women were sort of at odds with each other, but they knew that they had to work seamlessly together as part of an assembly line. And so they did. They did work. Uh, they did work seamlessly together. So Dot knew what she had done in terms of deciphering the messages. She had a pretty good memory of that. She remembered Miriam, but all of this was anecdotal. I mean, all I had was Dot saying what she had done. I had the letters that she had written her husband. I had a few letters that she had written other men. Uh, but I, I didn't have much more to go on. And so sometime considerably later, I, I braved the National Archive collections at College Park, which are an incredible resource. Um, you know, a paper resource, which I love. It takes a little while to sort of learn the procedures, to understand the pull times, to navigate the finding aids. I've never done any of that before. To learn what is OK to wear and OK to not wear. I had a, a little discussion with a security guard about whether I was wearing an outdoor vest or an indoor vest one day that it was uh, cold because outdoor vests are not OK. That's what I was wearing. Uh, indoor vests, which she was wearing, are OK. Uh, so um, I had to put on what Mark came to call my uniform um, to sort of have the right outfit on to brave the archives. But once I got there, uh, it, was, it, it was box after box of memos and, uh, and, and records and messages and worksheets, one of which had a, a woman's name, Dorothy, on it working this same code code group that, that Dot, whose name is Dorothy, had been working. I mean, it was this incredible array of documents and records from that time, because you had such literate people running this 7,000-person operation. Uh, and they were writing the most eloquent memos. And uh, uh, 
I was, I, I spent, I thought I was going to spend a week at the National Archives at College Park. I ended up spending at least three months there, going through, uh, in some cases, page after page after page, learning what the system was that Dot had worked on. I didn't even know yet that this was the one that she had worked on, because she didn't know either. Uh, and reading about the, the break in the water transport code, as it was called, it was broken by a team of three men and three women in the evening of April 1943. There was a very dramatic rendering of the breaking of that code system, which broke open uh, once they had broken the system, they had to read these messages every day predicting where the ships were going to be. And that's what led to the recruitment of all these school teachers. So I was going through these files that are a little bit random, very time consuming, but fascinating. I was a little bit tired one afternoon, and I was reading just a weekly memo from uh, building B2 at Arlington Hall, and it was a memo of the young women who had come through an orientation in December of 1943, and I was just, you know, running through the names, and I saw on the page, I saw Ruth Weston, and I, and I thought, wait, Ruth Weston, that's, that's a familiar name. Uh, Dot had referred to as Caroline, so I, I, I didn't register for a minute, but I thought, oh, I thought, that's that Ruth Weston, and then right above it, I saw Dorothy Brayden. And it was this confirmation, it was the first confirmation that, uh, that I had that there was a paper record of her service. And that one document said that she was being orient oriented into Department K of the operation called B2. All the names are very secret. And there were supplementary documents that um, that uh, told me what Department K did, that it was this group of school teachers who were working the Japanese shipping code. So I knew suddenly exactly where she was working, exactly what the operation was that she was part of. Uh, there were later memos that said, you know, that the school teacher, there were 232 of them. Uh, they broke, you know, 30,000 messages a month. Uh, there were lists of the Marus that had been sunk. So just that one, and, and I was so excited. Everybody who's worked in an archive knows that you have these absurd moments of incredible excitement where you just have to tell somebody of this incredible document that you found, at, you know, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So I took a photo of it, and I sent it to her son, Jim, and I said, I found your mom. And he immediately wrote back, and he said, she wasn't lying all of these years. She wasn't <laughs> making it up. And it was, the first, uh, it was the first confirmation we had that she was, in fact, part of this effort. I was later able to obtain from the National Archives personnel records uh, the, um, the, actually her full file, her full personnel file. It would not have had that information. So we needed the collection at College Park, but it did have her application. It had her background checks. It had what her teachers said about her, what, uh, what the mayor of Lynchburg said about her. Uh, it had her loyalty oath that she had signed. So it had her, her ratings. It had her, um, you know, her efficiency ratings, her evaluations. So it confirmed other aspects of her story uh, but I still wouldn't have known what operation she was part of without those that massive set of records at, at the National Archives. And that's just really one example of, um, of the incredible experience of, of trying to confirm these women's stories through records at the National Archives. Uh, and just to mention a couple of other examples, well, let me see if I can show you um, a couple other women uh, and who also were telling their story, and they were all able to be uh, confirmed. A narrative is obviously something that you add, uh, but what do you add it to? You add it to a five-digit code group, and the code group has a meaning, which is either a word, or a phrase, or a sentence, or a Roman letter, because we're dealing in Japanese mm -hmm. now, but they didn't make much use of the Roman letters, but they often did to spell names of right. people like mm -hmm. Roosevelt. So that's Ann Seeley. She was recruited out of Smith College in 1942. The Navy was competing with the Army for these educated women, and they sat, they, they, um, had a secret recruiting program that they started actually just before Pearl Harbor, but then really after Pearl Harbor, uh, which was the massive intelligence failure that confirmed that we really needed to ramp up our code breaking efforts. So they sent emissaries to the Seven Sisters schools, and women like Ann Seeley received a secret summons to meet with a math or astronomy teacher. They were asked two things. They were asked, do you like crossword puzzles, and are you engaged to be married? 
The correct answer to the first one was yes. The correct answer to the second one was no. If they answered the questions correctly, they were enrolled in a secret training course for their senior year and was enrolled in that course. They found their way down to the Navy office where they were assigned to work Japanese naval codes right around the time of the Battle of Midway, right in June of 1942. And the Battle of Midway was the battle that turned on code breaking and really put code breaking on the map. So Anne came down as a civilian. They were taught almost immediately to start working the Japanese naval fleet code, which was a five-digit code that was directing the Japanese naval ships all around the Pacific. So Anne, at 95, was able to remember that those code groups uh, could refer to a word, they could refer to a phrase, they could refer to a sentence, or they could just be a letter. And when I interviewed her at 95, she remembered that when they were doing the complicated kind of math, they had to, this was in ciphering, this was encryption that the Japanese were using. They had numbered code groups that stood for certain words or letters or sentences, and then they would add another code group onto it to encrypt it. And what she had to do day after day after day during the war was strip out that encipherment to get down to the original code group, and also to determine what the additives were that they were using, because they came from an additive book. And at 95, she was able to remember that one of the things they looked for was called a Shogoichi message, which was uh, the word for noon position. And if the message had that in it, that would be a ship telling the Navy where it was going to be at noon the next day. And of course, that's very convenient information for an American submarine commander to have, where a ship is going to be at noon the next day. So these women worked very quickly to recover those additives, to get those messages out, just like Dot over at the Army facility said that the submarine commander could sink, the, sink those naval ships. And so I, again, had this interview before I'd done any of the research. When I was able to um, immerse myself in the, in the records of the Navy code-breaking operation, I saw additives, Shogoichi messages. She had spelled it right. I mean, she remembered it so well 70 years later. She actually, at one point, I didn't show it. She's trying to teach me how she did what she did, and she's getting a little irritated because I can't quite understand whether she's adding or subtracting um, at that point. But she remembered it so clearly, and everything that she said was confirmed in these documentary records. And in fact, you would see these memos from their bosses saying, there's an important naval operation that's about to start. You recovered X many additives last week. You need to beat your record this week. And then I would see memos congratulating the women for not only beating their record, but exceeding it. And there would also be messages telling them to pick up scraps and empty the waste baskets and put their Coke bottles away. So you could really get a sense, though, of what it was like to be working in that facility. And it was extraordinary to me um, what Anne Seeley remembered and what they all remembered, and then what it was possible 70 years later even to confirm. Uh, now, women were also working the German naval codes. Uh, and they not only were working them, they were building the machines that enabled us to break the German Enigma codes and clear the Atlantic of the U-boats. Uh, and here is one of the women who worked on that project. And I'll just tell you quickly what I was able, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you actually, for some reason, that didn't come up. But I'll, I'll just tell you quickly that there was a whole group of women who worked on, uh, who worked on the Japanese naval codes, breaking the Enigma messages. Um, you've probably seen the Imitation Game and Alan Turing's breakthrough in determining how the Germans were enciphering their messages using these small Enigma machines with rotors that scrambled the messages. What that movie doesn't tell you is that the Germans figured out or, or suspected that their code had been broken. And so they changed the machine to have four rotors instead of of three. And at that point, the British machines could no longer handle the complexity of the German messages. And we built a uh, hundred machines in Dayton, Ohio. Women wired the rotors, and then uh, women came down and ran those machines. And by the end of the war, it was women who were, uh, who were looking at the scrambled German messages, uh, figuring out what words like uh, weather forecast in the Bay of Biscay were probably embedded in that message, and then doing the math to understand how the rotors might have turned one letter into another. That was called the key setting, and it changed every day. It was women who were programming the smaller machines that would then confirm whether they had gotten the key right. Uh, it was women who were, uh, who were breaking uh, who were then uh, translating those messages into English and writing up intelligence reports, again, for, uh, for the military to know either how to avoid the U-boats or how to sink them. 
Um, and so one of, the, uh, one of the documents I came upon in, uh, in researching that effort was the female mathematician who had worked on the project of um, actually making sure that, that the prototypes of these machines were working correctly. And she had to do a lot of the math in her head that the machines would do. Uh, she was an enlisted woman who went up to Dayton, Ohio to oversee the machines as they were trying to get them started working. Her name was Louise Pearsall. Uh, she wanted to be an actuary, uh, but her father would only pay for two years of college tuition because he knew that girls couldn't become actuaries and it wasn't really worth it to pay her tuition. So she went into the Naval as a, Naval, Navy as an enlisted woman, but because of the aptitude test that she took, she found her way into the Enigma effort doing very high level math work. Uh, and she was sent up to Dayton, but when she was sent back, she talked about, uh, because they brought the machines back to DC and, um, and, and ran them there. And she came back with the machines on the train. And she remembered having to go to a naval processing facility uh, with the other enlisted women. The male officers could go ahead and go on back to the naval headquarters, but the women had to be processed back through at another facility to come back and work in Washington. And she remembered being jeered at by the Navy men who were working in that facility. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, women coming down from Dayton. We know all about women coming down from Dayton. And she was like, what? You know, we are, we're working on this top secret project. We need to get back and, and get started. They're like, yeah, yeah. And so they actually had the women washing windows until, uh, until a top naval officer came to the facility and said, where are our women? These are our top women. We need them. And they found the women, mathematicians, washing windows. Now, why was that? I found in the National Archives files medical records of women waves who were working on machines in Dayton who were either found to be pregnant or they were found to have had abortions in order to get into the Navy because you, if you were, it, it was a big deal when women were admitted into the Navy as waves. And one of the things the Navy decided was that you couldn't be pregnant if you were a Navy wave just because it freaked, I don't know, it just freaked the Navy out. So, uh, so that was a rule. Men could have children, but women couldn't have children and stay in the Navy. They were a little concerned that some women who wanted to join up might get abortions and apparently they did, because what I saw were these records of women being sent down from Dayton if they were pregnant, and it was called Condition X. She's being sent back because of Condition X. And I don't know for sure, but I think it's, it's, it's certain that Condition X must have been pregnancy. But I also saw the medical records of women who had showed up at the dispensary for bleeding. And they were given medical exams, and, uh, and it was determined that they had had abortions before they entered the Navy, and they were immediately ejected as well. So the reason that Louise Pearsall, the mathematician, was held up in the processing facility was because the men thought she was a bad girl. And, and women who joined the military had to really confront that stigma anyway. So it was, it was extraordinary the way in which I, I, in what it was possible to take this oral history that Louise Pearsall had given her daughter and these medical records and discharge papers that just still existed in the Navy files and figure out that that's why she was held up in that facility. And she never knew it. She never understood. Um, so just one more example of the way in which actually the archival records at College Park led me to one of the code breakers in my desperate effort to find women while they were still alive. There's a wonderful document in the National Archives that was a morale survey conducted at the Army code breaking facility in the summer of 43. So they had broken this major code system. They had recruited all these southern school teachers. They had brought them up to do this exciting uh, work. But like any other government worker, they were working in a frustrating bureaucracy. They were in these huge temporary buildings. It was hot. There were giant fans. People were arguing about whether the fan should be directed here or here. They were government workers. You know, they were in the government now. And so there was all sort of just daily frustration and aggravation. People were chewing gum. Some people were working really hard. Some people weren't working hard enough. There was apparently a group of mean girls who were being mean to some of the, there was a man who complained at length about a group of mean girls who were being mean to some some of the incoming men. Uh, and um, there weren't very many men in the facility, but there were some older college professors who were you know, too old to be fighting. And, uh, and so this was, there was a, an incredible document produced called a morale survey 
uh, in which somebody went around to talk to all the workers about what was bothering them. And you can imagine, even though the people loved this work, even though they were being paid better than they were being paid as school teachers, they were being invited to complain. And so it was just this, this wonderful like 300 page document, a, literary, a litany of um, federal worker complaints. And it's, you know, the bus comes and gets people at the, at the station if they're going to downtown DC, but the bus doesn't come for us in the neighborhood that we live in and we have to walk to the Buckingham, you know, there's a group of women who aren't working as hard as they as they uh, should be. They they chew gum and they talk too much, and we don't like having to work at night. And the cafeteria food is bad. I mean, exactly what you would expect, um, even from people who were generally very contented. And so. When I was trying to find women, I was looking through the names of the people uh, named in that survey. And incidentally, there was a northern uh, uh, college professor and editor who was working in the facility who referred to the southern women as the jewels. And the reason he did that was because they had names like emerald and opal and pearl. <laughs> And in, as I looked through this morale survey, I saw that he was right. I mean, I could find emeralds and pearls. I could even find some jewels, some women who were actually named Jewel. I interviewed one of them. Uh, but as I was just looking through these incredible rosters of women and women's names from the 1940s, I came across the name, the name of Dorothy Romali, and I was working with a former Post researcher. We were trying to track down phone numbers. She said, oh, well, let me give it a try. I said, oh, all right, here. Try Dorothy Romali. And so she plugged it into her database and she came back with a telephone number. I called that number. Dorothy Romali picked up the phone. <laughs> she was living in an assisted living facility in Northern Virginia and uh, she grew up in Pennsylvania. She went to Indiana State Teachers College and I went out there and interviewed her twice. She was a mathematician. She studied math at a time when it was very unusual for women to study math because they knew they weren't going to be able to get jobs even as math teachers. And she had this vivid memory of, uh, of being secretly recruited by the Army, but also a vivid memory of why she wanted so badly to do this work. Um, and I just thought that I would play her description of, of watching the men in her math class being rounded up and taken off to war. A bus came, and it was at 2 o'clock in the morning that the Army sent a bus to get these, oh, I don't know. It seemed to me it was all the men, you know, that, that there were no men left in the college at that time because they all had to go, I think, to Pittsburgh. You see, since I was taking mathematics, a lot of times uh, I was one of maybe two girls that were in the classes, you see. So I knew so many of the fellows that were go going on that bus. And, uh, I'll never forget. Dorothy Romali uh, did incredibly important work for the Japanese Army code-breaking operation. She uh, also realized her life dream of becoming a math teacher, and I found in my conversations with her that she ended up teaching math at the public middle school that our children attended in Arlington. So it's just a sign of the way in which these women changed the course of the war. They changed the landscape of Washington, D.C. and Arlington, and they continued to live and, and even walk amongst us. And it was incredibly moving to get to have these conversations with the women and try to tell their stories but I could not have done it without the National Archives. Um, and so I'm so grateful for, for these incredible records, digital records and paper records. And uh, it was just, it was an unbelievably exciting experience to get to uh, spend so much time immersed in them. Uh, so with that, I'd like to take questions. Uh, we have a couple of microphones. We have a couple of microphones, if anybody wanted to come, just come up to the microphone. Hello, my name is Megan McCoy. I work in IT at the Pew Charitable Trust. Thank you for this event, it's fantastic. I'd like to know two things. One, um, what do you think you might do next? Because this sounds thrilling, and I can't imagine like you're gonna stop here. And then um, also, are any of the women going to be honored or have been with any kind of recognition nationally, like a medal of honor? 
Yeah, thank you for those questions. Those are great questions. The Navy women actually did receive medals, but they were secret. Uh, they were told never to show them to anybody, and they were reluctant. They were reluctant even to show them to me. One woman finally showed it to me, but she wouldn't let me take a picture of it. The, the Army women just got, really got a letter saying, thank you for your service, and never, please never talk about it. Uh, so it would be great to see them honored. It would be great to see some names on buildings. You know, Yale University just put Grace Hopper's name on one of their residential colleges. Uh, she was, uh, you know, a hugely important computer pioneer hired by the Navy during the war. So it would be nice to see some more names going up on buildings and maybe some statues erected. In terms of next projects, I don't know what mine is, but there are a couple of projects that, uh, there are a couple of, uh, of avenues that I wasn't able to follow as, as much as I wanted to. There's an African American unit that worked at Arlington Hall in the code breaking facility. It was a segregated operation, but it was a uh, unit, mostly women, who were working on the commercial codes of companies that were using enciphered communications. Uh, and, and they were trying to figure out if anybody was doing business with Hitler, uh, which nobody was supposed to be doing, or with Japanese companies like Mitsubishi. So uh, there wasn't as much information on the African American unit as I would have liked. There were just some photographs and some kind of sketchy descriptions. Uh, so I would love it if some more collections appeared or if there turned out to be some families who um, had some maybe records in their family. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, a great program. Um, you must have, in your research, uh, uh, uncovered uh, uh, areas of, uh, of interest beyond what you're uh, presenting. Uh, how many women were uh, turned uh, or compromised uh, by uh, uh, foreign services uh, while they were in, your, in the service of the NSA? I don't, I, don't, I don't know of any during the wartime operation. There were some men who got their start uh, uh, at Arlington Hall who were later found to have been turned. It may be true of women, but if so, I haven't read or heard of any of them. Um, I do know that there were a couple of women. There were some whacks at the Army compound, some Women's Army Corps uh, uh, code breakers, and there were a couple of whacks who were assigned one day to see if they could pen penetrate the Arlington Hall facility. Uh, and so they resourcefully disguised themselves as civilians, went up, said that they wanted to apply for a job. They were sent inside. They managed to steal some badges. They managed to um, just circulate during the course of two days and take classified material. And they handed it in at the end of the day to the military. Uh, so they were able to penetrate facility, but fortunately they were doing so um, you know, on behalf of us and not anybody else. If you don't mind, uh, I have been uh, uh, someone interested in code and cipher since I was 10 years old. I'm 74 now. And I have a number of books in my lab library. And after college, or actually during college and after, uh, my then wife and I communicated. She was a systems engineer with IBM in the uh, mid-60s. And we communicated uh, by mail. Uh, with code, and she would have to decipher and send me code. And we did this back and forth. And she taught me how to wire boards in the early days of IBM. Uh, and as a systems engineer, a math major, a physics major, etc. But I thought it was fascinating how we were able to write on the envelopes uh, for the postman to read. Uh, but of course, we had to write in regular uh, uh, English. But we had code and cipher on the front. And then when she opened up the letter, or when I opened up the letter, it was totally in code. And she had to decipher it. So, so we had a great So your children time. and grandchildren, you'll, you'll be safe from their prying eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank There's you. a long distinguished history of love letters written in code and cipher. So you're in a, you're in a long and distinguished history. Thank you. The women, the women code breakers also used some code words of their own. Uh, there was a group of Navy women that had a, an agreement that if they were out, they had a lot of fun in Washington. And if they were out drinking somewhere at the Willard or, or wherever, uh, and somebody was showing too much interest in their work, uh, you know, like what were you doing in that big co in that big compound? Uh, they would they would somebody would order a vodka Collins, and they knew that if somebody ordered a vodka Collins, that meant that somebody was showing too much interest in what they might be doing, and uh, they were all to disperse to the ladies' room and then flee the uh, the, per <laughs> the uh, grounds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you for bringing the code breakers to light. Um, I'm curious as to whether you ran across the name Laura Beatty 
in any of your research. I'm sorry, what's the last name? Beatty, B-E-A-T-T-Y. You know, not that I can remember, but uh, as I said, I mean, there were there were amazing rosters. I mean, in the National Archives, they have they have rosters of all the women who came from the Seven Sisters each year, hundreds and hundreds of names. They have the incoming women like Anne. I was able to find Anne Seeley's name on the incoming roster and even where she lived in, in Washington, D.C., where when she first came. So it's it's scattershot. Uh, the morale survey has hundreds of names also. I've tried to figure out if there's some way I could get all these names up on, up on a website so that people could look through them. Um, but you can obtain, if you're interested in someone in your family, you can obtain their personnel records from the National Archives in St. Louis. Uh, and I have a, on my website, which is LizaMundy.com, I have a page that explains to people how they can do that. And well, the names me, of some Let me tell you a little you bit have. about Laura Beatty. Um, she's my mother-in-law who passed away about four months ago at the age of 99. Um, she was a code breaker, uh, Japanese code, um, who uh, basically kept the secret from the family. She never really disclosed much in the way of what she did, although we knew that in fact she was a code breaker. Um, but the, the, the importance of the question that you mentioned is sort of this initial screening about whether they like to do crossword puzzles is relevant because Laura, until she lost her eyesight uh, a couple of years ago, did the New York Times crossword puzzle on a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> and now, if you can imagine doing that, that gives a little bit of a clue as the kind of mind that we're yeah. dealing with yeah. with the women who are a part of this oh, sisterhood yeah. <laughs> of code breakers. Yeah. It's somewhat frustrating now. I mean, there, it's, it's unavoidable that since the book came out and even a little bit before, I started getting emails from people who had, uh, you know, women in their families and sometimes, you know, letters and audio tapes and, uh, and in some cases, you know, women who are still alive. Uh, so there was, you know, it's the kind of thing where you could research it endlessly. So it's just as well that I had a time's up pencil down moment where my editor not spend little, any more time in the National Archives. One other little bit of, of sort of the close call in your research she ended up at Randolph-Macon Women's College, not on the faculty, but because her husband was recruited out of the NSA by the Ford Foundation to set up an Asian studies program there. And so she uh, and her husband uh, lived there, um, and she ended up getting her bachelor's degree from Randolph-Macon at the age of, I think it was 69. Oh, wow, wow. So she was a code breaker without a college yeah. education. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had become very enamored of this generation of women. You know, many of them were born in 1920, which was the year that women got the vote. Uh, but then the Depression hit when they were nine years old, and they lived through the Depression. Many of them seemed to have been the oldest daughter in their household, and they really felt the trauma. Uh, many of them were able to still describe the trauma of, you know, of fathers who came home and said, you know, all our money is gone. And, uh, and then, you know, when they were 21, Pearl Harbor uh, happened, and all the men in their lives were shipping out. And, you know, some of these women were able to read messages that, uh, that told the fate of their brothers and their boyfriend's ships. And, uh, uh, and um, they knew what was happening. And in some cases, they were actually able to tell their parents uh, that their brother was safe and not tell their parents how they knew. Uh, but in some cases, you know, they learned uh, about brothers and men that they loved being lost. Uh, and they, they, so they lived through this incredible period and contributed to it. And many of them went home afterwards, but all of them retained really, really close friendships to each other. And, Many of them did re-enter the workforce and then, or use the GI Bill to get graduate degrees, and uh, they paved the way in uh, in ways that we don't give them credit for. And just as Mark said, you know, because they kept the secret so well, we still have people out there saying, well, maybe women aren't fit to work in Silicon Valley in tech. You know, when in fact this was the dawn of cybersecurity and this was the dawn of computer technology and hacking, they were hacking into enemy communication systems. So they pioneered the field. And I think, you know, because they kept the secret so well, uh, we still have, amazingly, to, to sort of back back these stereotypes. Just one final question for you, Eliza. When are we going to see this on the big screen? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well the, the process has started. Uh, I can say that. Um, <laughs> the, 
that uh, Jim Parsons, who's the actor who plays a NASA engineer in Hidden Figures, um, has a production company, and they've uh, optioned the uh, right to you know, try to bring this to the screen, uh, either the big screen or the small screen. And so that would be fun to think who might play him. <laughs> Thank you so much.